Okay, good morning everybody. Um, so I'm John Hughes and uh, this is Mary Sheeran, my very long time colleague and wife. <laughs> so more than 30 years ago, I wrote a paper called Why Functional Programming Matters. It was a kind of manifesto for functional programming. And uh, that paper has become my most widely read paper. And um, uh, it's probably also the reason why we got the invitation to speak here today. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about that paper. But of course, functional programming is much older than 30 years. So we're also going to talk about its origins and some of the landmark uh, developments in the field. Uh, some of the developments that are just personally important to us, and also a little bit of our own work. So it's, it's a kind of personal history of functional programming that you're going to get this morning. Uh, by the way, don't miss David Turner's history of functional programming tomorrow morning. I'm looking forward to that very much. So functional programming dates back to um, the 1940s, but it was very different in those days. Way back in 1940, functional programming was really minimalistic. So, um, for example, let, let's take Booleans. You think Booleans are important in a programming language, but maybe you don't need them. After all, what are Booleans for if not to make a choice? And perhaps we can already do that with functions. We had to have functions in a functional programming language, of course, but, but maybe they're, they're enough. So let's see if we can define true and false as functions. Okay, well, to make a choice, you have to have two things to choose between. So let's make them functions with two arguments. And let's just say that true will be the function that returns the first argument, and false will be the function that returns the second argument. So you can see I've defined two functions now. I'm calling them true and false, but can I use them like Booleans? Well, let's see if I can define if then else. Right. What does if then else do? Well, it takes a Boolean and a then branch and an else branch. That's T and the E. And I've got to choose between the then and else branch using the Boolean. Oh, I can do that just by calling the Boolean. So if I get true, that's going to return the then branch. If I get false, that's going to return the else branch. So I don't need Booleans in my programming language if I have functions. Isn't that cool? Well, what else don't we need? What about numbers? Who needs them? I mean, what is an integer for? Okay, I'm talking positive integers here. What is an integer for if not for counting loop iterations? So let's just define two, for example, to be a function that takes a loop body f at an initial value x and just applies the loop body twice. Okay, and likewise, one will be a function that applies the loop body once and zero will apply it zero times. OK, so now you, you see which function I'm going to use to represent each positive integer. But is this really a good representation? Can, can I turn one of these functions back into a normal integer? Well, sure I can. I can do it in Haskell um, just by calling 2 and iterating the increment function. In Haskell, that's written plus 1, starting from 0. So if I increment 0 twice, what do I get? 2. It really works. OK, so, so now I can represent integers in, as functions, but for that to be useful, I, I want to be able to operate on integers without converting them to and from normal integers. Can I do that? Can I add two of these functions together? Well, let's see. How would I iterate a loop body m plus n times just like this? First iterate it n times, and then iterate m more times on the result. We just sequence the loops, and that will execute the body m plus n times. So this add function, that's going to add integers together in this representation. What about multiplying numbers? Well, I can sequence loops to add them. I can nest loops to multiply them. Right? So how do I execute a loop body, loop body m times n times? I have an outer loop that executes m times, and in the body, I execute f n times, m times n. Does it work? Well, I can type something like this into Haskell. Here, I'm adding 1 to 2 times 2, and that many times I'm going to iterate incrementing 0. Yes, we get 5. Well, you can go on in this vein. Right. So, for example, um, let's take the factorial function. Here it is. I'm sure you've all been waiting for this. 
You have to have the factorial function in every talk on functional programming. This is how you could have written factorial in 1940. And I'm just using if then else to say, you know, if, if n is 0, I'll return 1. Otherwise, multiply n by the factorial of decrementing n. Does this work? You can type this into Haskell. Let me take the factorial of 1 plus 2 times 2, and that many times I'll increment 0. Yes, you get 120. Uh, even you get it quite fast. OK, so there's more detail here I haven't shown you. called church encodings. Now, why did he do this? Well, um, he was interested in showing that all of mathematics uh, could use functional programming as a foundation or functions as a foundation. So um, that's why he was trying to represent everything else in terms of functions. But actually, this is not just of theoretical interest. Early versions of the Glasgow Haskell compiler represented data structures this way. Not integers, obviously, that would be stupid. But data structures were represented this way because that used to be the fastest way to do it, believe it or not. Uh, there was a man called John Fairbairn who uh, wrote a, had a new idea for a functional language compiler. And just to get it working quickly, he implemented data structures with church encodings. And then after a while, once the compiler got more mature, he thought he would put the work in to implement them properly. And the code went slower. So uh, they were actually quite a good idea. Um, they, they were the fastest way to implement data structures way back around 1990. They're not anymore because this stuff really screws with branch prediction. But um, it used to be quite, performed quite well. Anyway, um, if you try this at home, I should warn you that if you just type in exactly what I've shown you to a Haskell system, uh, you get this error message. Occurs check. Cannot construct the infinite type. Blah. So that, that sounds quite kind of scary. But don't worry, Haskell's type checker is very helpful. It doesn't just say this, it also tells you which type it expected <laughs> and which type it got. And by the way, this is the first time I've had a reason to use a three-point font on a slide. Okay. Might, do you think you could see the problem from that? But don't worry, there's more information. The types of all the bindings. Um, so what I've shown you works in Haskell, but the type checker needs a little bit of help. You just have to tell it the type of factorial uh, by adding this line. The black stuff there, the type checker would be able to figure out for itself. The red bit is what you have to add. OK, so back in the 40s, Church could write functional programs, but he couldn't run them. That wasn't possible until about 1960, when John McCarthy implemented Lisp. So this was really exciting. At last, you could run functional programs. There's the factorial function uh, in Lisp. And, and right from the start, Lisp lets you treat functions as data. So you had a map function. It was called map list in, uh, in Lisp. You could map the factorial function over the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you'd get the list of factorials. So you know, functional programming was, was starting to arrive in the form that we know it today. But I want to skip ahead to a paper from 1965 by Peter Landon. It's a, a, another landmark paper, The Next 700 Programming Languages. And I've just taken a little, little quote from the abstract here. He said, today, 1,700 special programming languages are used in over 700 application areas. By 1965, there were already 1,700 programming languages. Landon thought this was about 1,699 too many. He thought it would be sufficient with one programming language, his programming language, and 700 libraries for different application areas, which makes a lot of sense. So he proposed a language that he called iSwim for if you, if you see what I mean. And uh, there is the factorial function in iSwim. Um, but I'm not going to focus so much on iSwim itself as on another point that Landon made in that paper. 
Landon was very interested in what he called laws. Uh, and a law is basically an equivalence between two different programs, which should always be equal. Here's one about Lisp, which says that if you take a list L and you reverse it, and then map a function f over it, you get the same result as if you first map the function over the list and then reverse that. So Landon was very uh, eager that programming languages should satisfy a lot of these laws. But this law in Lisp isn't really true. It's only nearly true. Because Lisp functions could have side effects, and those two equations, those two expressions, they call f with the same arguments, but in a different order. So you could get different results in Lisp. And Landon didn't approve of that. And he even discusses this point in the paper. He says, you might be wondering, what's the point of, you know, uh, of having two different ways to do the same thing? Why would you want these two programs to be equal? Wouldn't it be better if they did different things? Because then you could choose between them. You'd have a choice. Doesn't that sound good? No! Landon thunders. Expressive power should be by design rather than by accident. Yes, Mr. Landon. So this idea of laws was something that Landon placed great emphasis on. Iceworm satisfied a lot of nice laws. And it's an idea that comes back again and again in the history of functional programming. Spacebar. <laughs> I would like to jump on 12 or 13 years from 1965. So there was a certain amount of marital strife in the negotiations about what should go into this talk, I would say. But this paper was a given from the start. There was no chance that we were going to give a talk about functional programming without talking about this paper. John Backus won the Turing Award in 1977. If you haven't heard of John Backus, he's, he's the person behind Fortran and the Fortran compiler, the first compiler for a high-level language. So he could have given a Turing Award about his success in making this fantastic compiler and all the, all the money it made for IBM. But he didn't. He chose to give a talk about something completely different, a completely different approach to programming. <coughs> so the, the very first sentence of the abstract says this, conventional programming languages are growing ever more enormous, but not stronger. This is in 1978. <clears throat> Inherent defects at the most basic level cause them to be both fat and weak. What kind of weaknesses did he mean? The, 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 their primitive word at a time style of programming inherited from their common ancestor, the von Neumann computer. And he termed in the paper the von Neumann bottleneck as the tube between your, your CPU and your, and your memory. And he, he, he discussed the von Neumann bottleneck not only as something difficult for compiler writers to figure out how to pass the data along this thin tube, but also as an intellectual bottleneck preventing us from thinking at a higher level of abstraction about the tasks that we need to accomplish. Another weakness, their, ability, their inability to effectively use powerful combining forms for building new programs from, from existing ones. He wanted to think in terms of how, think of ways of building programs and, and, and uh, kind of capture common patterns. So let, let's imagine programs as these blocks of pictures with data flowing from right to left in these pictures. So he introduced a combining form that he called apply to all, and he wrote alpha, and we would call that map today. And that takes its data in, applies the, the blue block to each of the elements and, and gives you the outputs. He had another combining form, as he called it, called construction. So if you wanted to apply different functions to the same data, for example, the functions f1 to f4, you would end up with a pattern that looks like this. The data would flow from right to left into each of the functions and produce four outputs. So he, he studied you know, what, what should be the set of ways to build programs from smaller programs, and that was really quite a new idea then. But he studied them in a particular way. He wanted to design those combining forms in a way that would give useful mathematical rules for reasoning about the resulting programs. So he criticized existing programming languages for their lack of mathematical properties for reasoning about programs. What's an example of the kind of law that he was listing in his paper and interested in? Here's one. If you have 
the composition of a G, a, blue, a, a bigger blue block with a construction of F1 to Fn. That has the same behavior as putting the blue block com composed with each of the F1 to Fn. So this is an example of a law, the construction of F1 to Fn composed with G equals the construction of F1 composed with G, F2 composed with G, and so on. And then this word at a time thing that he was very concerned about. Here's an example of a, a loop, the kind of loop he didn't like. We want to compute the inner product of two vectors, A and B. So we set C to zero and we do a loop from one to N, uh, adding to C AI times BI, inner product. He instead wanted to write it this way. You take in your two uh, lists of values, you tra transpose them into a list of pairs, you apply multiplication to that list of pairs, and then you reduce with plus to get the result. He had a slightly strange no notation for reduction and for map and so on, a bit of APL-ishness here. But the whole idea was that you should construct your program from smaller programs using these higher order functions or combining forms. Read the paper. If you haven't read Bacchus's Turing Award paper, read at least the first half of the paper. The second half maybe hasn't survived the test of time to the same extent. He, in, in particular, he didn't like lambda calculus, which might not be, bad for, might not be good for lambda days audience. But um, uh, the first part of the paper must be read by anybody who's interested in computer science or programming. Please go and read it. And I noticed yesterday when I was reading it again myself, the reference list is great. Just go and read all the papers in the reference list of that of Bacchus as well, and you'll be, you know, well-educated in the history of functional programming. So that, was, that, that is absolutely one of our favorite papers. Now I'm going to move on to another favorite paper of mine, uh, and, and John agreed to its inclusion. <laughs> um, the next paper I'm going to talk about is by Peter Henderson, who was my PhD supervisor in Oxford. And Peter had two loves, or had, I presume still has two loves, functional programming and Escher pictures, the pictures of Escher. So he wrote a paper called Functional Geometry in 1982, and the, the paper is about deconstructing one of Escher's prints. You know, Peter poured over these prints and tried to figure out how did he get the fish to fit together so, and how could I decompose this and give a nice, nice description of it. So I'm going to go very quickly through. In, in fact, there are two versions of the paper, one from 82 and one from 2002. And what I'm showing you here is, is the decomposition he showed in 2002, which is not the same as the one he showed in, in 1982. So there are many different such. So we, if we can make a fish, and it probably took him a while to figure out exactly how to draw this fish. Then we can also make the overlay of a fish and a rotated fish. That'll give us a little picture with two fish in. We can also make the overlay of one of those fishes and two smaller rotated fishes to make a kind of three fish, three fish sub picture. Those little fishes, I had to read the paper again, are root two times the length of the, uh, of the, of the other fishes. How, how Peter figured that out, I don't know either. But we have overlay, we have rotate, if we're thinking of combining forms here. <clears throat> we could take four of those uh, smaller fishes and make overlay four differently rotated versions of them and stick them together. We can introduce a new combining form co called quartet, which just composes four pictures, P, Q, R, and S. We can start to think, okay, so that, that, that we had that picture from the previous slide. Uh, where's my arrow? That's the middle. That's the middle of the picture that I showed you right at the beginning. So we've got the middle sorted. So how do we sort, how do we get the rest of the picture? Here he's starting to think of how to make the sides. We can take um, two of those three, three uh, fish pictures, one of them rotated. And then we can add... <coughs> Um, that, call that side one. Then we can add two more copies of that on the, on the, on the, on the top. Then we, we, we've kind of figured out how to make sides. Let's figure out how to make corners. It's similar. A quartet uh, sticks it in the, in, the, in, the in the bottom right here. And then we can add some sides and another corner. Uh, 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 actually, one corner and uh, two sides here. And eventually we get to the point where we can write 
a, a nonet, which is something like the quartet, but has nine uh, composed parts, with a U in the middle, and then various four corners at different rotations, and four sides at different rotations. And at that, we end up with something that looks very like uh, the square limit. It's not as beautiful, not shaded, but the decomposition is correct, and that's what, worry, that's what Peter was really worried about. So uh, there's the, the thing he was trying to represent, and here's the, the, the decomposed picture. But there are actually deeper messages. So there are deeper messages than how to, de how to uh, determine, how to describe an Escher picture in that paper. <coughs> One of the messages returns to what John said, use functions to represent things. So in, in, in Peter's paper, pictures are represented as functions. They take three vectors indicating wh where the, the box in which the picture is to be placed, one for the uh, origin, one for the bottom line, and one for the side. And once you've made this decision to represent pictures as, fu as functions, what do, what do we want to do? We want to generate from these pictures the, se the operations that are needed to draw it on some graphical device. In our time, it was a plotter in the basement of, of the programming research group, and the kind of plotter that picks up pens, draws part of the picture, and then puts down the pen and picks up another pen and draws another part of the picture. It was great. We used to drink our coffee watching the plotter. Um, once you've decided, uh, that this is how you represent pictures, you can start to def des describe, what, well, what does overlay mean? Overlay means if we want to overlay two pictures, P and Q, at A, B, B, C. Well, we take P at A, B, C, union, Q at A, B, C. The, the, what we need to draw P, union, what we need to draw Q at the same place. We can define beside of P and Q at A, B, C as uh, um, we, we need to figure out what should be the origin and the two, two defining vectors for P, and what should they be for Q. And from this picture, it's relatively easy to figure out. The origin for P should be A, and its uh, lower vector should be B over 2, and its, its, left vec its other vector should be C. And for Q, it should be A plus B over 2, just to move over to the origin of Q. Similarly for rotate, um, if you want to rotate P at ABC, you just need to think of how, should, how does the picture look? Well, we just, want, we just need to move the origin over to A plus B and have the, the first vector be minus B and the second be C. And while developing this set of ways to build pictures, all the time Peter was thinking, what are the laws of these uh, higher order functions for building pictures. Here's an example of a law. If you take P above Q and you rotate it, that's the same as the beside of the rotate of P and the rotate of Q. And, and what happened was we, I would go, I was the implementer in, in UCSD Pascal, so I would go away and dream up some, some of these higher order functions, and I would come back to Peter and say, I think we should use this, and we'd say, well, what laws, does, what laws do they obey? And in the end, he, he, he came, he developed a very nice set of these higher order functions for building pictures. And, and, and in the paper, he says, he's, it seems there is a positive correlation between the simplicity of the rules or laws and the quality, quality of the algebra as a description tool. So uh, the deeper message of the paper is that it's easier to think of a denotational means to describe something than it is to give an algorithmic description of how to construct it. So, so far we've seen some classic papers that we both love, and we've picked out four key ideas that we think are really important through this history up until about 1982. Whole value programming, it get away from word at a time programming, as, as Bacchus uh, called it. Combining forms for building programs, the algebra of those combining forms as a litmus test for the design of those combining forms, and very importantly, functions as representations. So now I just want to skip ahead a little bit and uh, talk about, about a paper that isn't so well known, but it's a real favorite of mine because it's such a great story. So it's got the rather unwieldy name, 
Haskell versus Ada versus C++ versus Orc versus dot, 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 an experiment in software prototyping productivity. It's from uh, 94. So in the mid-90s, you couldn't get research money to develop functional languages for real programs. But you could get research money for developing functional languages for prototyping. Software prototyping was very hot in those days. It was like microservices today. And uh, Paul Hudak at Yale University managed to get part of a big DARPA grant for prototyping languages to work on Haskell. And those other languages, those are languages that other groups were using for prototyping. Anyway, quite, quite early on in the project, then DARPA wanted to find out, well, how good are these various languages? So uh, they thought, let's give the same problem to all of the groups and ask them to build a prototype and see how well it works. So it was a geometric problem. 2D geometry, DARPA being DARPA, then you had to define regions in the plane with names like weapon doctrine and um, engageability zone. And then the prototype would also receive information about aircraft. Uh, here's a hostile aircraft and a commercial aircraft. And it was supposed to spit out uh, some conclusions. But, you know, at time 40, the commercial aircraft will be in the engageability zone and the tight zone, and the hostile craft will be in the carrier-slave doctrine. Okay, so you don't really have to know how those things work. You just have to be able to represent regions and manipulate them. And Mark Jones was... Paul's postdoc at the time, and he got the job of building this prototype. So, you have to represent regions. Hmm, thought Mark. How can we represent stuff? Wait a minute, what about as a function? So, Mark represented a region as a function from a point to a Boolean. And the, the function will return true for points in the region and false for points not in it. And that makes operations on regions really easy to define. What's the outside of a region? Well, you just negate the Boolean. What's the intersection of two regions? You just take the and of the Booleans. So Mark was able to write the code very easily. And when the results came in, here's a chart. I know it's hard to read, but um, that column there with the red thing, that's the number of lines of code of the solutions. And Mark's solution in Haskell was 85 lines of code which compared very well with 760 lines of ADA or 1,100 lines of C++. So uh, he had by far the smallest solution to the problem. Uh, what I think is a real shame is that in Haskell, then uh, you can let the type checker figure out a lot of type information, or you can write it. And Mark was the kind of person who liked to write that type information. So his 85 lines of code contained 29 lines that the type checker could have put in for him. It could have been 56 lines of code. But there we are. Anyway, so when these results were reported to DARPA, the evaluators didn't believe it. So, without telling Paul or Mark, they found a PhD student somewhere else, and they said, okay, you've got eight days to learn Haskell. And then they said, okay, now you solve the problem. That's why Haskell is in the table twice. The second smallest solution, which was 156 lines of code, so much bigger than Mark's, that was the student who had been studying Haskell for eight days. That, I think, is really impressive. It really illustrates the strength of functional programming. So you would think, of course, that um, when the evaluators got this stuff, they would be delighted. I mean, functional programming had performed so extremely well. No, Mark's solution was too cute for its own good. Higher order functions are just a trick, probably not useful in other contexts. So next time you use higher order functions, remember it's just a trick. Well, that was um, too bad, but there we are, ahead of its time, I guess. So now I want to go back to the 70s to another idea that was very, very important to me, and that's the idea of lazy evaluation. Um, a, a number of people had this idea around that time, but there are two landmark papers in particular by uh, Henderson and Morris. See that guy on the left? It's the same Henderson. Um, and uh, they were, Peter was in the UK, and Friedman and Wise at Indiana University uh, wrote another paper, Con should not evaluate its arguments. So, lazy evaluation, the idea is that 
before, when you put a, something, an expression into a data structure or you pass it as a parameter, you shouldn't evaluate it straight away. You should just evaluate it later if it turns out to be needed. And if you're not familiar with lazy evaluation, the best way I can explain it is to compare it to trying to get a teenager out of the house. Put on your coat. I will. Put on your shoes. I will. Clean your teeth. I will. We're going now. Oh, wait a minute. If you're a parent, you will have had that experience. So that's lazy evaluation. And I was really inspired by this, and in particular by the fact that while we've talked about programming with whole values rather than a word at a time, once you have lazy evaluation, the whole value can be infinite. It could be, for example, the infinite list of natural numbers, or the list of all the iterations of a function. Now, of course, we're never actually going to compute all of the iterations of a function, but the point is this program can compute as many as you want, and it's the consumer of that data structure that decides how much of it will be computed. And I found this really exciting because it meant that you could separate the code that decides how much you want to compute from the code that specifies how to compute it. And a few years earlier, I had um, studied numerical analysis without very much success, I must admit. But I realized that I could write a consumer for arbitrary numerical methods. Many, very many numerical methods work by constructing a sequence of approximations, which is in principle infinite, and then taking the limit, waiting for it to converge. So I could write the convergence test to take the limit as a separate function that would take any list of approximations, any numerical algorithm, and just compute as far as you needed to get the result within a tolerance epsilon. So I could write a square root program by taking the newton raphson method um, and iterating that, that approximation to generate a list of approximations, take the limit. I could write a derivative function by constructing a list of smaller and smaller lengths, computing the slope at a point uh, for, of little straight line segments that get shorter and shorter, and then taking the limit. And the limit code, the convergence test, was the same function. I could reuse the code instead of needing to replicate the same idea over and over again. All I had to write for each new algorithm was the code to construct the approximation sequences. So that was great. I was able to write numerical algorithms and understand them. But there's something else you can do, and that is you can speed up convergence here. So I already talked about differentiation, where what you do is you measure the slope of shorter and shorter line segments. You compute integrals by adding up the areas of narrower and narrower rectangles. And in both cases, there's this parameter h. By making h smaller, you get more accurate results. So in each case, when you have a numerical method works like this, you can express the result in the form a plus b times some power of h. So a is the right answer, and b is an error term. And the error terms are a power of h. OK, if you do that, suppose you take two successive approximations computed for a value h and half that size. Then you know two values, and you've got two unknowns, a and b. And remember high school mathematics. In that case, you can solve for A and B. That means all you need is two approximations, and you can solve for the right answer. Isn't that amazing? You compute your approximation sequence. You just need the first two. You get the right answer. You don't need the rest. Oh, well, that's not quite true, because the right answer is itself approximate. The error term here is an approximation. But if you take the next two approximations, you get a better right answer. And you can keep doing that. And you get a sequence that converges much faster than the original. It's a better numerical method. So you can just write a function that takes a sequence, eliminates the error term, and gives you another sequence that converges faster. It's a better numerical method. In my numerical analysis course, I spent a whole term trying to learn better and better numerical methods. And now I just have to write one function. So here's a really fast derivative. Um, first of all, construct the approximations, let's improve it a couple of times, and then take the limit. And you can build it all up just by reusing functions that are programmed separately and are all easy to understand. That's whole value programming for you. 
These are some of the examples from my, my paper. It's a nice paper. If you haven't read it, you should. So what, what we've seen here is the idea of separating the producer who can potentially produce any amount of values from a consumer who uses those and decides how many should be programmed. And being able to separate those into separate pieces of code, I found really exciting. So I've talked about doing it for a convergence test as the consumer from numerical approximations. But there are many other situations in which you can use the same idea. The consumer might be a search strategy, and the producer might construct a search space. So in the paper, I showed how to implement a game program. I implemented the alpha beta heuristic, which is a rather complex search strategy for game trees. And for the first time, I was able to program just the search strategy without mixing in the code for exploring the space of the game. And then I have a separate piece of code that built a game tree for the game concerned. I had a rubbish computer at the time, so the game I did was Noughts and Crosses. But in principle, you could take any game. And I've used the same idea many times since. For example, I uh, wrote a paper some years later on designing a pretty printing library. Pretty printing, that means, for example, taking program source code and laying it out nicely. Or if you have data structures in your program, you want to display them in a form you can read, then you want to display them with indentation that shows their structure. And writing pretty printers, if you do it from scratch, it's hard work. It's very easy to get the indentation wrong. Making the choice between, you know, should I use a vertical or a horizontal uh, layout here, it's quite hard to do. So I, I was able, in the end, to design a library that makes it really easy. You have a selection criterion for the best layout. That's a consumer which explores a search space consisting of all the possible ways to lay out a document. And thanks to lazy evaluation, I was able to separate those two. How do you construct the ways to lay out a document? Well, the library also provides a small number of operations for constructing a space of layouts. It's a small number of operations that satisfy simple laws. There's a nice algebra. And I used those to de derive my implementation um, in which, guess how a document is represented? Yes as a function. So that uh, paper is one of mine that I'm very proud of. And I know it's a good idea, because so many other people have improved on it since then. <laughs> and indeed, nowadays, almost any functional programming language comes with a pretty printing library that, through some sequence of <laughs> descendants, descends from, from that paper. So um, the, the work that I'm probably best known for nowadays is uh, quick check. And this is really the same idea again. So if you're not familiar with QuickCheck, uh, it's a testing library, uh, originally for Haskell. Uh, there are similar libraries for many languages now. And what, what it lets you do is, instead of writing tests, you write a property, like this one. This says, for all lists x's, which is a list of integers, if you reverse the list twice, you get back the list you started with. And we give that property to QuickCheck, which just generates some random tests and uh, runs them all. Uh, more interesting is when the property is not true. For example, this one says, if you reverse a list, you get back the same list. Of course, you don't. In that case, QuickCheck will quickly find a random test that fails. There's a list that's not its own reversal. As you can see, it's uh, um, quite long. There's a lot of irrelevant information in there. And then QuickCheck shrinks it down to a minimal counterexample. In this case, 0, 1. Why is that minimal? Well, if you think about it, any list of length 0 or 1 is its own reversal. So a counterexample to this property has to have at least two elements. The smallest list with two elements is 0, 0. But that's its own reversal. So the smallest counterexample is 0, 1. That's why we get that. So what's happening here? Quick check has a search strategy, uh, which is programmed separately. And then the properties construct a space of all possible tests using combinators that satisfy nice laws represented by functions. And the search strategy in this case, first of all, does a random search until it finds a counterexample, and then it systematically uh, searches for the minimal one. So it's the same idea again. I'm afraid the conclusion from all this is that I only have one idea. But luckily, it's a good one. <clears throat> I'd like to turn the clock back to about the time of Bacchus's paper, slightly after. And I want to come away from the world of functional programming entirely. 
Uh, this is a book called Introduction to VLSI by David Conway. And this book revolutionized the way in which VLSI circuits were designed. It was published in late 1979. It was associated with courses also about how to do it. And it, it brought VLSI design to computer scientists at large. It had the idea that more people than a small group of uh, priesthoods, a small priesthood could do uh, circuit design. It, it, it allowed a much more structured approach to VLSI design. This appeared in 1979. So I, then I went to o Oxford in 1980, and I read Bacchus's paper, and I read this book, and, and I was an electrical engineer who was supposed to turn into a computer scientist. So I thought, okay, what shall I do? I will take Bacchus's FP, and I'll make a circuit description or hardware description language out of it. So what I did was I took FP, the language described in that Turing Award paper, and I turned it into a kind of streaming language. Today I would say I made a streaming version of FP. But it, so I added unit delays and, and, and I studied combining forms. So I inherited many combining forms from the original paper. But when you try to describe hardware, you get a, a few that don't actually seem to arise in software, but only arise in hardware. And then I, I, my idea was you take your spec and you buy a sequence of transformations a la Bacchus should get to a circuit. And, and what, what kinds of laws arise when you have this idea? Here's an example of one. <clears throat> um, if you have a, a, an orange block through which you can push two of these blue blobs, the, the, blob, the blue blobs might be these unit delays or there might be some other function. If you know that this is true and you have a connection pattern that plugs together a kind of linear sequence of the orange blocks, then you can study what happens when you put a lot of the blue blobs on the inputs to the, to the uh, linear array. And we can apply the law once, the original uh, hypothesis. We can apply that once, and again, and again. And eventually, one, one blob will end up on the, on the first output. We'll kind of remember that. And then apply the same process to the remainder of the circuit, which looks very similar. So we can just keep going. So now we've ended up with a kind of linear array of these orange blobs with the, the blue blobs in between. And, and in, in terms of circuits, this can be very important um, because now the, if, if the orange was a kind of combinational block and the, and the blue blobs were latches, then we have much shorter, longest paths through combinational blocks and we can clock the circuit much faster. And, and the, the, the triangular shaped thing up at the top there the people we were talking to in industry at that time really were putting triangular shapes of, of, of latches onto their circuits. So this is an example of one of these combining forms that seemed to arise more in hardware than in software. And so this, this language we called MUFP, and we actually had users. <coughs> um, Plessy were making a, a so-called video motion estimator circuit, a very regular circuit that was part of uh, um, uh, estimating motion in, in uh, videos. <clears throat> and they used MUFP, and here's, here's what they reported in a paper later. Using MUFP, the array proce processing element was described in just one line of code, and the complete array pro uh, required four lines of MUFP description. MUFP enabled the effects of adding or moving data latches within the array to be assessed quickly. Because we gave them a, 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 a kind of symbolic simulator so that they could run their programs and have a look and see if the, the right values came out in the end. And that replaced having kind of graph paper on the floor of a large room and walking around to make sure that the right data appeared at the right place at the right time. So this was a, a kind of early success for a functional hardware description language. Unfortunately, just after this success was achieved, largely by my colleagues in Oxford, uh, Geraint Jones and Wayne Look, GEC, another company, bought Plessy. <coughs> And that was the end of the project and the end of this design team. And it all ran out in the sand, as we say in Swedish. <clears throat> and then there was a bit of a delay. But we came back to the question of how can we use functional programming languages um, for hardware design um, a bit later. So Satnam Singh, who was my student in Glasgow, later worked at Xilinx, which is the maker of one of, of field programmable gate arrays, reprogrammable hardware. And so Lava, which was uh, uh, embedded in Haskell, took mu the MUFP ideas and put them together with the functional, functional geometry ideas to allow you to design FPGA circuits 
while um, getting control of uh, relative placement of, of, of the circuit. So mu fp gave you the semantics of what you were trying to make, and functional geometry gave you the placement. So you controlled the placement of your circuits on the FPGA. <coughs> but only the relative placement, just like the fish. If you go back, remember the fish, when describing the fish, you never had to say, this one is at this location. You just described the kind of relative placement. And this allowed us to, to produce FPG, FPGA layouts on dialing chips with just enough control over what was produced. For example, this is one of the early efforts. This is what happens on the FPGA if you take four adder trees and don't have that control of the placement. You get a dog's breakfast. Um, there's, there's some simulated annealing going on behind there to try to figure out how to wire, wire everything up. And th this might not be so bad, except that if you can't get a nice placement sometimes, then you, can't pr you probably can't fit the, the, the desired algorithm onto the FPJ. And if you give eno just enough control of placement, then you can fit uh, larger circuits onto the FPJ. And the way Satnam operated was that he would often be brought in to, to rescue customers who were not managing to fit what they wanted to implement onto the current largest FPGA. And he would figure out how to do it in Lava and send the customer a Haskell binary without ever telling them that they were doing anything to do with functional programming. And uh, this was actually a very good way to, to go forward. Um, but it, was, it, it depended very largely on the magic of, of Satnam. <laughs> it was not something that was transferred to designers at, at, at Xilinx. And in the end, when Satnam left, it kind of stopped, unfortunately. But I have, I have another success story to talk about, so all is not terrible. Sometimes pain causes development, good developments to happen. And I want to talk about the Intel FDiv bug, um, the Pentium bug, it's been called, which was in, 19, I think, 1994. Um, on, on, on the Pentium, it was the case that if you took a, a, a number for example, a number beginning with four here, and subtracted from it a number beginning with three times that same number divided by the same number uh, beginning with three, you should get zero. But on, on, on the flawed Pentium, you got 256. And, and somebody noticed <laughs> that in, in, a, in a very few small number of cases, you would get the wrong number when you did division. Um, and this was, uh, at first Intel tried to say, it, it, it's so rare that it doesn't matter, but the, in the end, they had to uh, agree to replace any, any Pentium that sub, a, a customer wanted replaced, they had to replace it. And they took a loss of $475 million. And it almost brought down the company. Uh, and in, in a kind of typical Intel move, they issued a key ring which they gave to all of their current staff, I think it was. And the key ring said, I uh, have to peer at it here, bad companies are destroyed by crises, good companies survive them, great companies are improved by them. And what did they do to improve? Well, one of the things they did to improve was hire a, a, a crazy Swede called Carl Seeger. And, and, and they, the, the CEO of Intel said, never again. We will never again have this kind of bug. And we will hire whoever we need to hire, and we will do whatever we need to do to make sure we don't have this same bug. So Carl Seeger, who had been working at Waterloo on a formal verification based on functional programming, moved into Intel, took exactly that system which was called VOS before, made a system called Forti, based on a lazy functional language. Um, they do everything in this lazy, it's his own lazy functional language. There's a bit of a Shalmers link here, because he, had take, he's a, he, he, he went to Shalmers for his undergraduate, and he'd taken a course in functional programming from Thomas Jonsson and Leonard Augustson, who were early implementers of lazy ML, lazy functional languages. And at the time, he thought they were nutters, he told me last week. He, he thought, these people are, are crazy. Functional programming will never take off. And then 10 years later, he found himself you know, inside Intel, reading every word of every paper they'd ever written, trying to figure out how to make a good functional language compiler. And they do everything at the functional language. They express designs, they write high-level specifications, they script the use of formal verification tools, they write formal verification tools, and so on. So this is a kind of hidden success of functional programming. <coughs> 
And because they have a functional programming language, a lazy functional programming language, they can do exactly the same games that John just described to you. So they've done uh, very similar examples to the pretty printing example, except they will express you know, ways to lay out a parallel prefix circuit and a separate selection criterion to give lowest power or lowest power for some speed or something. And they've had a lot of success with doing this and, and getting very good circuits out. Um, and here's a, here's a slide from a talk that Carl gave at uh, Shamra's last week to kind of express where they are with this combination of functional languages and uh, formal verification. So this slide expresses from the left how to get from an idea on the whiteboard to an actual micro, microprocessor. This is about a three-year journey, and in fact, there are a lot of loops back in this, so it isn't just a straight journey from the ideas to the, to the end. But a large chunk of this, from kind of where you have your register transfer level, your code for the circuit, all the way to the layout, is formally verified. They, did, they don't go for bug, it's not verification for bug hunting, it's actual proof that they're aiming for. So FPV means formal property verification, formal equivalence verification, and so on. So that whole chunk of the, of the process is based on a, fun, a lazy functional language and makes a, a full use, replacing simulation of uh, um, formal verification for the more computationally heavy parts of the, of the microprocessor what they call the execution cluster. So for the more algorithmic parts, it doesn't work so well for the control parts, control-oriented parts. But this is a huge success. This is one of the reasons why they have not had another uh, Pentium bug. <clears throat> now you might think, um, so what, what happens in that process that I described before is actually that they, they first design the circuits and then they throw them over the wall to the verifiers. And the verifiers have to first figure out what is the circuit supposed to do, and then they have to do the verification. So it's, it's, there's something intellectually unpleasing about that, even though it's hugely successful. So you might think, well, maybe we would prefer to take a specification and by, in the spirit of Bacchus, applying transformations to it, eventually get to the layout. And amazingly, Carl Seeger has also produced a tool that does exactly this inside Intel. So when I first went to Intel and saw that tool, it was like seeing what I imagined in my PhD thesis, but somebody had done it inside Intel. It was quite amazing. And now, interestingly, Carl has left Intel in the middle of last year, and he's going to redo exactly this, but aiming at FPGAs at the end. So he's, he's at Chalmers right now. If you want to come and visit and talk to us about FPGA design and, and transformations or whatever, please come. And we're going to have a, a, a ball making a new tool for FPGA design. Speaking of FPGAs, I have a, one final success story to talk about. If you, if you think about hardware description languages, the territory is pretty dismal, mostly. Except there's one nice language that you can use out there in the real world to des design hardware called BlueSpec, which is F FP for hardware. Um, and and it, it, it brings all the advantages of functional programming to the development of hardware. They, they use it largely for developing circuits for running on FPGAs as part of the process of designing ASICs. ASICs. So they're kind of using the FPGAs to get fast, fast simulation of what they will eventually produce as an ASIC. And there's a nice paper about that that you can look at later by one of the people from, from the company. Now, if you have a nice way to take a functional, programming, a functional program and put it on an FPGA. What functional program do you think you might like to put on the FPGA? Well, I know what John would like to put on the FPGA. Quick check. And this is what uh, uh, Matthew Naylor in Cambridge and uh, Simon Moore have done. So now there's a version of Quick Check for BlueSpec, which allows you to do all this generation of test data and shrinking and all this cool stuff on the FPGA. So it runs really fast. It's extremely cool. They call it, what do they call it for the hardware? A generic synthesizable test bench. That's the kind of hardware speak for it. And it's blowing hardware designers' minds. And it's extremely useful in practice. So this is a nice bringing together of the hardware uh, world with the lazy uh, functional language and quick check that John represents. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, so 
we've come on a, a very, very long journey back from church encodings of numbers ending up with quick check on an FPGA. How cool is that? But throughout the journey, we've seen the same ideas coming back again and again. The idea of programming with the whole value, not just a word at a time using combining forms to put smaller programs together into larger ones, choosing a design that satisfies simple laws, and using functions as representations. Those ideas come back again and again and again over the history of functional programming. I think we would have made Bacchus proud. Thank you. We have some time for questions, so any questions, please. All right. Thank you very much. I would like to remind you that uh, we have two levels. Ah, there is a question, sorry. Um, try to ask loud. Can you repeat the question, please, John? So the question was, we've talked a lot about the past of functional programming and about the present, but what about the future of functional programming? Well, I think one, one thing that we have all seen is that um, uh, functional programming is, is spreading through everything. I mean, there's barely a major programming language nowadays that doesn't have features that are inspired by functional programming. So I think, um, uh, in a sense, functional programming has won in that some of the basic ideas are becoming a part of mainstream software development. And, uh, of course, I'm very, very happy about that. When I first got into this field, though, I remember um, I went to a summer school in 1981, and I heard David Turner who will be speaking tomorrow, um, talking about his ideas for functional programming. It was really inspiring. And uh, he said, we're facing a software crisis. We need to improve the cost of software by an order of magnitude. Functional programming can do that. In five years' time, when parallel hardware comes, nobody will be able to write imperative programs anymore. Functional programming will take over the world. Well, that would have been 1986, so it's taken a bit longer than that. But um, I think if you look at uh, the kind of programs that you could write in mainstream languages back in 1980, and the kind you can write today in functional programming languages or, or other languages that have borrowed a lot of features from functional programming, that order of magnitude has been delivered. But software is still growing enormously. So now we need another order of magnitude. And um, what, as a researcher, what intrigues me is the question, where is that next order of magnitude coming from? Maybe program synthesis can help with that. I, I don't really know. If I knew, that's what I would be working on. But I think that's the, the question for the researchers of today and the future. How do we get the next order of magnitude and the one after that? Um, we live in interesting times. Yes? Yes. So, um, indeed, relational lisp took only three hours. Now, I have to confess here that what I've done is I've taken one table out of the paper, and of course, there is a lot more information in the paper. Uh, if you read it, you find out, among other things, that the Lisp version doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fascinating paper, and there's a lot more than we can possibly talk about in just a few minutes. So I really recommend finding that paper and reading it. You, it's a joy to read. It will be great fun. So you talked about the benefits of laziness in evaluation. But there are many disadvantages of laziness, too. Like, it's, like they say, it's not efficient. 
Can you compare the benefits and the drawbacks of laziness? Um, yes. So, so the question is, uh, what are the disadvantages of lazy evaluation? For example, inefficiency. So inefficiency, I think, is not a big problem nowadays. It was when, uh, when lazy evaluation was first introduced. But um, there's been, what, 30, 40 years of work since then on functional language compilers. And there's been a great deal of work on making lazy evaluation efficient. Um, so that it's, it's not a big cost nowadays. It, indeed, in some cases, a lazy program can be much more efficient than one that's not lazy. Because, um, for example, streaming programs. Even if you're not using a lazy programming language, you, you might want to build a streaming program because it means you don't have to store as much data at the same time. The problem with lazy evaluation is that because the programmer doesn't need to think about when thing gets, things get computed, and indeed doesn't really have a good way of thinking about when things get computed, then you can end up with some rather bad schedules. Uh, in particular, you can end up uh, storing, you know, saving things for a long time. Maybe it would be much more space efficient to compute them earlier. And uh, so lazy programming languages have a reputation for being hard to uh, optimize the space use of. Uh, at the same time, there's been a lot of work on heap profilers, for example, so you can get very good information about what what data is taking a lot of space. And um, I think that there's a skill that you have to learn if you want to use a lazy functional programming language effectively, how to debug the space use. But I'm, I'm, off, I'm in the camp that um, says you shouldn't write your program planning every aspect of its performance in detail in advance. You should write the program, get it correct, keep it simple, and then measure. And once you've measured, you should optimize you know, those few places that really are imposing a big cost. And in my experience, measuring and then optimizing the space use of lazy functional programs is not so hard. In fact, um, uh, small changes in a lazy program can make dramatic changes to the space use. And that makes it hard to get it right at the beginning, but it makes it easy to make those small changes that need to be made to bring a dramatic reduction in space use. So there are swings and roundabouts there. Different people might give you a different answer on that point. But I think that, that's the key thing that people would discuss if talking about the disadvantages of lazy evaluation. All right, thank you. We are now running out of time, so thank you very much again. And thank you all.